for a gun. More than 800 people, though, packed into the Church of St. Francis Xavier in New York Friday for the funeral of Dan Berrigan, the legendary anti-war priest, poet and activist. He died April 30th at the age of 94. Dan and his brother, the late Phil Berrigan, made international headlines in 1968 when they and six other Catholic anti-war activists burned draft cards in Catonsville, Maryland, to protest the Vietnam War. Prior to the funeral, hundreds took part in a two-hour procession beginning at Mary House, a Catholic worker house in the East Village in New York. Democracy Now!'s Mike Burke was there and spoke to participants. I believe we're going to start our uh, march uh, now, and so I would think that we would want to create some space here, uh, maybe walk together arm in arm, linked um, again with great energy, with chanting, with song, because this is a celebration of Dan's life and of life itself. Telling us uh, your name and why you're here today. I'm Dar Williams, and uh, I'm here because I wrote a song that had to do with the Catonsville Nine, and then everything changed. <laughs> as soon as I wrote that song, I met all of the people who were part of that song, and um, and here I am, you know, 15 years later. Do you think you could sing a verse of that song right now? Uh, sure. It goes, um, God of the poor man, this is how the day began. Eight co-defendants, I, Daniel Berrigan, and only a layman's batch of napalm. We pull the draft files out, we burn them in the parking lot. Better the files than the bodies of children. I had no right but for the love of you. No right but for the love of you. So it's like a prayer saying to God, you know, they tell me I had no right to do this and I had no right to do this but for the love of God. I'm John Deere and uh, walking here along the streets of Manhattan to remember Daniel Berrigan. We're just passing the Catholic Worker House where Dorothy Day lived and worked. Dan's great friend is going to soon be canonized. And I'm here with all our friends on the way to the funeral. Uh, to commemorate Dan, one of the greatest peacemakers of our times, my great friend, who called us to take to the streets and to say no to war and injustice and nuclear weapons and, uh, and to put nonviolence into action. And how did Father Berrigan influence both the peace movement as well as the Catholic Church? Daniel Berrigan inspired millions upon millions of people after the Catonsville Nine action, uh, to he, his the symbolic act of the Catonsville Nine, especially him, but he and his brother as priests. This has never happened before, and it was so shocking. But it led to millions of people taking the streets and inspired the peace movement. And you could argue there were 300 draft board raids. It helped end the draft, and help helped end the war. But then he changed in the process. The Church, Catholic Church in the United States, actually all the Christian churches, and the church around the world. We never had a priest so publicly actively against war. Now it's normal. And a priest going to jail and prison for peace, now that happens all the time. But he broke the, gr the new ground and, in effect, helped get rid of the just war theory and return us all back to the peacemaking life of Jesus, which was the point of the church. So he's not only a great saint and a great prophet, he actually uh, one of the great revolutionaries who's inspired the movement and the change of the church. It's been quite an accomplishment. We ain't gonna study war no more. We ain't gonna pay for war no more. Can you begin by telling us uh, your name and how you knew uh, Father Berrigan? No, my name is Frida Berrigan. I'm Dan Berrigan's niece. Um, and uh, yeah, it's raining and we're on Houston Street and we're remembering him and all the times he stood in the rain and uh, and there weren't 300 people and there wasn't a band and there wasn't all of this joy and um, and we're reminded that like this is this is where it happens right it doesn't happen in the classroom it doesn't happen from the altar it happens in the street and um, it happens those places too but not without this.
Uh, my name is Ted Glick. I met Daniel Berrigan in 1970 when I was active in the anti-war movement of the Vietnam War, the draft resistance movement. Uh, I mainly got to know him in prison. We were both in prison at Danbury, um, Connecticut for draft, draft board raids. Him for the Catonsville raid in 1968 and me for a draft board raid in um, 1970. Can you describe what happened to Catonsville and then describe the significance? Catonsville was where nine people went into a draft board, um, Catonsville outside of Baltimore. They took the 1A files, the files of young men who were liable to be drafted and sent to Vietnam. They took them outside and they put homemade napalm on them and burned them. Um, that was the, there was one other small action before that in Baltimore in the fall of 67. This one in May of 68 was the one that got lots of attention, lots of publicity, and it started a movement that I ended up getting involved with of people who went into draft boards all over the country, uh, as well as corporate offices, uh, FBI offices a couple of times, and took direct action, nonviolent direct action, serious direct action um, against war. Uh, and injustice, particularly against the Vietnam War, of course, at that time. Um, so the significance was that for the anti-war movement, uh, it gave a real shot in the arm to that movement at that point in time, and it continued to do so with the uh, growing number of these types of actions that just continued to multiply over the uh, next three, four years. <laughs> My name is Anna Brown. I'm a member of the Kairos community. I'm here primarily today, uh, first of all, because uh, I love Dan very much. Uh, I've been a member in community with him for 25 years. And because he was such a great force of love in this world. Uh, in the Catonsville Nine, he talks about the creation of a new order of gentleness, of kindness, um, of loving uh, community. and. We just don't do that. We just don't do that. And I think that's why there's been this incredible response to his death, because really he's all about life. And in a time where we're watching children drown in the Aegean Sea and climate change is barreling down upon us, though we remain in denial and we're fighting war after war, someone who speaks about love is someone who we need to listen to, but not only spoke about it, acted on it, did it so consistently. I can tell you, uh, Dan was doing civil disobedience almost to the end of his life. Can you begin by telling us uh, your name and uh, how you knew uh, Father Berrigan? I'm Joe Cosgrove, and I've, I've known Dan Berrigan for uh, more than 35 years. Dan was my pastor, but I was in theology and law. Well, gee. What two better subjects than to, to put to use for Dan Berrigan? So I was his lawyer then for over those 30 years and uh, in all sorts of matters and issues that he, uh, when he was arrested in many times in New York and other matters and civil rights issues. Can you describe some of the more memorable cases that you represented, Father Berrigan? Well, you know that, as I said last night at his wake service, uh, Dan turned everything into liturgy. So for me, I'm litigating, but for him it was a sacrament. And to see that contrast. So his statements and his testimony in court, every one of them were scriptural. I think in particular at the resentencing of the Plowshares 8, which after this decades-long appeal process when there were, uh, the, the case was overturned, the conviction was overturned, then it was reinstated, but then the judge was removed, and then finally after 10 years it seemed that there was an exhaustion in the legal system, and the resentencing was ordered with a new judge. And because of my, my work in the, that system, I, I was doing most of the work at the resentencing. And Dan's statement to the court is um, it's one of the most profound things I've ever heard from a historical, from a legal, and from a theological point of view. He combined all three. And it's, it's poetry. Dan's a poet. It's scriptural. He's a scripture scholar. Uh, it's liturgical. It's beautiful. And uh, that really, I think, is one of the crowning moments in maybe in American legal history to have that statement read in court, stated in court. Do you remember any of the lines from that statement? Um, he said, if you think that putting me in jail will help end the war, then take me away.
you can begin uh, by telling us uh, your name. My name is Art Laffin, and I'm with the Dorsey Day Catholic Worker in Washington, D.C. And uh, the sign that I'm holding, uh, I hold every uh, Monday morning at our Pentagon Peace Vigil, 7 to 8 a.m. The vigil's been going on since 1987. And uh, for a radio audience, what does the sign say? Well, the, the sign says, uh, no cause, however noble, justifies the taking of a single life, much less millions. It's a quote from a, 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 a talk that Dan gave on the ethic of resurrection. But it sums up, it sums up his uh, unequivocal commitment to uh, nonviolence, which is rooted in, in the scripture. Uh, his life was, uh, was staked on the command, thou shalt not kill, and to love your enemies. Um, my name is Colleen Kelly, and I don't remember the first time I met Dan. I know it was somehow connected to Covenant House when I worked at Covenant House years ago. Um, but I, he made an enormous impression on my life in many, many ways. And uh, I think one of, the, one of the things that sticks out for me is my brother was killed on September 11th here in New York City, and uh, in, in, that, in the shock of all that, within the first week, I, I went to go see Dan and just talk to him about, about this tragic, awful thing that like, was, was so incomprehensible and impossible to understand. And I don't, Dan was a poet, and I'm, I don't really get poetry all that much, but, and I don't know, you know, he was a wise man, and I can't tell you a wise phrase that he told me that night, but I can tell you, like, his heart just came and enveloped my heart, and I knew at, at that moment, not at that moment, like, it was just Dan, having Dan's backup and love and compassion, it, it made it very clear that the only way to respond to, to the violence that had happened was nonviolently and with justice. And it, and it feels like Dan helped, helped me understand that in ways I never thought I would concretely have to understand. And I was so glad that he was a part of my life prior to that, so that he, he was there in that really awful, awful, tragic moment. Uh, if you've been telling us uh, your name, uh, you know, how you met Father Berrigan and why you're here today. My name is John Bach. I was a draft resistor during the war in Vietnam, and I first met Dan in the uh, dining hall of the federal prison in Danbury, Connecticut and it was love at first sight. And what do you think is most important for people to know about Father Berrigan? That freedom and liberation are things that you can declare for yourself. And when you do that, you never lose a step and you help your community move forward into the light. And how long did you spend in jail? I spent uh, 35 months, just under three years. And I can say, because of Dan, because of what he taught me, uh, most of the time I was not with the Berrigans, uh, that it was three of the most formative, spiritual, educational, and in some ways fun years of my life. I have no regrets whatsoever. Do you know of any other draft resistors who spent longer periods in jail than you? There was only one. And what are your thoughts today as we march you know, in the rainy streets of New York, as we head towards the church? Uh, that there is a spirit working among us that strikes us free as we work together on behalf of other people. And the best we could do at the end of our lives is to ask ourselves two questions. Were we well loved and did we serve other people? And for Dan, there's a rousing affirmative unquestionably about that. So uh, I'm uh, Kathy Boylan. I'm a, a Catholic worker from Washington, D.C. And I was 24 years old on May 17, 1968. Turned on the radio, uh, and I don't, I don't think it was WBAI, but I was in New York, and I heard the story of uh, Catonsville. And I, I was already the mother of two little children. I had another baby on the way, and I describe myself as standing up a different person, one with a, a view of taking responsibility for trying to end the war in Vietnam. Uh, the day before, I didn't think it was my responsibility. So uh, that's how I, I first met him in the story on the radio of Catonsville, uh, of the Catonsville Nine action. 
But then I, heard, I got to meet him. I was in the, uh, in the prison yard at Danbury in 72 with Dan when Phil was released from the—he the, he got a six-year sentence, I believe, for Catonsville. So I was then, by then, from 68 to 72, I was already part of the community. Then I heard Dan say, uh, in, in uh, quoting the Isaiah scripture, they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. And he said, well, who are these they who are going to do this beating swords, if not us? And uh, so that led led me to uh, swim to a Trident submarine and hammer on various uh, implements of war. Uh, I've been arrested. I, I am so happy. I am so blessed. It was miraculous that I listened to that radio program in, uh, on May 17, 1968. My whole life is different because of it. My name is Kathy Kelly. I'm a co-coordinator of Voices for Creative Nonviolence, and I'm here out of deepest respect and appreciation for Dan Berrigan and for the very wonderful community that has come together to remember his life and to be grateful. And what impact has Dan had on your life? You know, as a teenager, if I got on the express bus early, I could get downtown before starting work and go to St. Benet's bookstore and read about Dan Berrigan. And, um, so since that time, he's had a, a strong shaping effect. I was, um, was very impressed that in 1991, when a group of people from the United States assembled to go and kind of interpose ourselves between warring parties in Iraq, and people said what motivated them, over half the group had been motivated by Dan Berrigan's words. And uh, likewise, in Afghanistan, uh, young kids now know about his work, have read his poems, and uh, it's really wonderful to hear uh, that a whole group of mainly Pashto students stood up and cheered after a Hazara student read a poem by Dan Berrigan that moved him. Can you begin by telling us uh, your name and uh, how you knew uh, Father Berrigan? John Shushard from the House of Peace in Ipswich and my wife Carrie. I met Dan about 40 years ago, uh, exactly this time of year, 40 years ago, at Mary House where we began the walk this morning. And uh, it, uh, it has guided and influenced uh, the following 40 years of my life in a major way. And uh, my wife Carrie met Dan and when she was 16 years old. And that too was a formative influence in her entire life. Uh, so uh, that led uh, to uh, Jonah House and ultimately to nuclear resistance. Uh, and. Uh, then uh, forming a community of eight to go into the nuclear weapons factory at General Electric in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, September 9th, 1980. Can you go back to that day in 1980 and, and describe what you did and, and why you did it? Well, uh, we had been, Brandywine Peace Community had been vigiling at uh, plant number nine. Uh, where there were 600 workers making the nuclear warhead, the Mark 12A first strike nuclear warhead. And uh, as we vigil there, and I joined the vigil a number of times, came up from Jonah House and vigiled with uh, Bob Smith and the Brandywine community, uh, we realized that uh, we could get into that plant. Uh, and uh, if what we understood was true, that this was a, a crime, that this was a manufacturer of uh, genocidal nuclear weapons, each war had 35 Hiroshimas, uh, and there's no such thing as a non-genocidal nuclear we weapon, uh, but these are each one 35 Hiroshimas, is it enough to stand outside and vigil? And we decided it really wasn't, that we could go in and stop production. Uh, we decided that we would enter uh, with the workers at the peak uh, of the uh, morning work day. I think it was about 7 a.m. in the morning. And uh, Carl, uh, Father Carl Cabot and Sister Ann Montgomery would talk to the guard there and distract that guard. The rest of us went into the plant. And uh, as it turned out, we found two warheads in the early stage of production, took hammers to them, rendered some of the manufacturing equipment uh, unusable. 
stopped the manufacturing process and uh, poured our human blood, which we had drawn from ourselves, on the uh, work orders and the blueprints and uh, uh, the office details of, of this genocidal work. Could you describe uh, the influence of Father Berrigan on, on your life and what do you feel is most important for people to know about him? Well, first of all, uh, going back to Vietnam, he had a powerful influence on me. And at the time of the Plowshares Aid, I had just taken two Vietnamese boat refugees and then many, many more. And that led eventually to the founding of the House of Peace for refugees and children of war. Dan was always asking, how are the children? And the last visit we made a couple of months ago, how are the children? And the influence of somebody who had such unbreakable, unrelenting moral awareness and uh, direction and courage and the ability to affirm everybody that was in it with him. And he loved people. He loved the people of this city. He loved he loved. Voices from a procession heading to Father Dan Berrigan's funeral on Friday. He would have turned 95 years old today. And that does it for today's show. I'll be speaking tonight in Minneapolis at the Parkway Theater and on tomorrow in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Check our website, democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.